Okay, everybody. So uh, I'll go through this uh, presentation on Jane Eyre in relation to these three important topics. Uh, Mike doesn't seem to be working. Let's see if there's any better luck with this one. And uh, gender, empire, and madness are three of the main in the in the novel. I talked before about how Jane seems to be quite prejudiced against foreign things, but um, it's also to be noticed that these things are never quite as simple as they might seem. She is quite happy to engage with the British Empire in certain ways. Basically, the most important of them would be economic. Madeira. Now, Madeira is an island off the coast of Africa. It's not in the Caribbean, as one or two people mistakenly thought. All right? So be careful about where it's placed. It's not in the Caribbean. It's not close to Jamaica or um, where Bertha comes from. And by choosing Madeira as the place where Jane's uncle makes his fortune, she brings up a very positive picture of the British Empire because... Britain's relationship to Madeira was, um, or seems to be, in a, in a certain way, a very friendly sort of relationship, in the sense that, well, Madeira is a Portuguese island, or it was owned by the Portuguese, and still is part of uh, Portugal, uh, but it was a part of the British Empire for quite a long time, uh, basically during the earlier part of the 19th century. And so that's the period of Jane Eyre. Now the British were there, why were they there? They were there to stop M Napoleon, who was building a, an empire across Europe and, and everywhere he could, he was trying to build an empire. And so the British said, okay, we'll, we'll come into Madeira, not in an unfriendly way, but to help you, because we don't like Napoleon either. And then when the threat from Napoleon was over in 1814, they gave the islands back to Portugal. So that gives a very positive picture of the British Empire and the way it was behaving in the world. How nice the British were. They just went to Madeira to help. Well, maybe. It's actually, really, it's a little bit more complicated than that because, yes, their economic interests were also at stake. I mean, look at John. Look, look at John Eyre, her her uncle. Look how he makes all his money there, and the British, in fact, have been making money in Madeira ever since. The British ran the whole economy of Madeira from the 17th century until the 20th century, and a large part of that was uh, a type of wine called port, which uh, John John Eyre is in the market for this wine, and. Uh, the British made fortunes out of uh, Madeira. And so John Eyre would have gone there in about 1821, if we look at the timeline of the story. Jane would be about 11 years old, and he made a fortune in the wine business. So choosing Madeira is a good way for Bronte to show Britain as an economic and trading empire, and also show how it was against France and Napoleon. Remember Adele and the whole way of showing uh, her mother. It, it, a lot of it is kind of these, these French, okay, these French, we have to stop them. So that's in the air at that time. And because of that letter, she no, uh, he knows that they go, she's going to marry. Let me just add a little bit there. Jane writes this letter because she's embarrassed to be marrying Rochester when she herself has so little money. She feels, you know, he's much higher class than me and I'm not bringing any money to the marriage. Uh, the Joshiki would be, the normal thing would be that she would bring some money to the marriage and she doesn't have any. So she's writing to her uncle and saying, hey, you said you wanted to help me. Well, here's your chance. I'm getting married. Uh, if you want to give me some, some money, yes, please, <laughs> basically. So uh, that, that letter, arrives, John Eyre, Eyre reads that letter, then Richard Mason comes and he says to Richard Mason, oh by the way, um, the, this guy Rochester is going to marry uh, 
and my niece, and uh, Mason says, what? He can't do that. He, <laughs> she's all, he's already married to my sister. Okay, so he comes panicking back to, to England uh, to, 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 to stop the marriage. That, so that's the, the way it fits together in the story. Well, that brings us then on to Bertha. Rochester also benefits from Britain's trading empire, but he benefits through Bertha and Jamaica. By marrying a Jamaican Creole, he comes into a fortune. And her family give him their daughter and 30,000 pounds. Why do they do that? Because very means Okusabin Sabitsu no Hanashikata, he is of good race. Because he's of good race, the family say, oh yes, take our daughter and take our money. Uh, she will get status, our whole family will get status uh, by marrying this rich Englishman. So she brings 30,000 pounds, sorry, by marrying this English, he's not even rich, okay? His family is rich, his eldest brother gets all the money. Later on he dies and he gets all, he gets everything, but at the time of marrying, I'm sorry, he's not rich. He's of a good family, he's of a supposedly a good race because he's English and uh, so uh, Bertha's family are happy to pay money for her to join that family. So basically that's saying Bertha is lower than him because she's a Creole. And yeah, the, the word Creole, we talked about this, it has different meanings depending on what society you're talking about. Um, in, in the Caribbean, it usually means the descendants of white settlers with some mixture of black blood. So the, the picture I've shown here of a Creole, Bertha might have looked something like that at the time that he married her. She is described as being very beautiful. But now she's mad. She's locked up in Rochester's attic. She's said to have a goblin appearance and a pygmy intellect. Okay, the brain of a pig. A pygmy was an African. Again, that means Okusabitsu. A pygmy is a tribe of African small people, uh, basically small in size. And uh, a pygmy intellect, a very small brain. Uh, and looking like a goblin. And her face is described as either black or purple. So after marrying her, Rochester finds, or at least he says, that she's uneducated, she's coarse and trite, she's perverse and imbecile, and possibly uh, she, she cannot be educated, she cannot be improved. And she's got a violent and unreasonable temper. Again, all of this is according to Rochester, that's what he says. Insanity runs in the family, idiots and maniacs through three generations, and she finally uh, goes mad and has to be locked up. But remember, that is all as Rochester says it. Uh, there's a lot of question about whether we can trust Rochester here. So there she is, okay, the mad Creole lady. Of course, she doesn't look too different from anybody dancing in the disco. And that's, that's the point, you see. That's the whole point. For, for Rochester, the fact that she's like that might be enough to think that she's mad. Okay? That's, that's something we'll come to a little bit later on. You know, is, she, is she mad or is she just a, a free spirit with a different kind of culture from him? Okay? Hello? Uh, yeah, that should be. Yeah. And of course it ends up with her... her <laughs> Fire, fire, the fire symbolism gets, gets very kind of uh, tied up with all of this. Um, <laughs> I hope you're, yes, I hope you're enjoying my, I had a bit of fun with this presentation. Uh, so um, yeah, the fire symbolism and uh, uh, all of that, of course. So her wild passion is symbolized by fire. At the, en at the end of the story, she burns down Rochester's house, she kills herself, she blinds Rochester in the process. So she's wild, she's untamed, and she's un-English. Adele is also foreign, but she can be cured. Bertha, though, is beyond recovery. She can't be cured of her foreignness. And, of course, we, she has no voice of her own. We never hear what she thinks or feels. 
She doesn't really exist for the reader as an, indi as an individual. She only exists as she's shown to the reader through the filter of Rochester and Jane. And she is defined by her actions as well, and her actions are basically her strange laugh, the way she escapes at night, the way she attacks people and property. Well, those, those actions do look like the product of madness. But it would be men who decided, and English men, who decided in the end that Bertha was mad. Now, if she could tell her story, it might be very different. And next term, we'll be looking at Jean Rhys, White Sargasso Sea. She herself is a Creole, and she tells Bertha's story. So I think you'd be very interested to read that next term. All right? She finally says, let's give Bertha a voice. Let's write her story. Let's imagine, let's imagine who she might have been, what her life might have been like. And so uh, Jean Rhys, who very much liked Jane Eyre and, and admired the story, was very upset about the way that Bertha was shown. So she decided to write her own book, and that's a famous example of what we call talking back. Okay? Talking back is what cheeky children do to teachers or to their parents. We say, don't talk back. Okay, I, I'm the boss here. But of course, the British aren't the boss anymore. All right? And so people talk back and say, hey, you British, you shut up this time. I'm talking. Okay? Voices from India, voices from uh, Jamaica, voices from around the colonized world are talking back. And it's an important part of uh, literature today. So we'll be coming to that next term. All right, the issue of race. Jane is a work of fiction. Bertha doesn't have any real identity outside the, 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 the novel. But we can ask whether Jane's a reliable narrator of her own story. She understands that uh, she has been mistreated at the hands of her aunt. You know, she's, and she actually says, how could, how could her aunt really like an interloper not of her race. She actually uses the word race to say that she is of a different race from her, from her aunt, just meaning that we don't have the same blood, we're not from the same family. In, in her heart, she's the same. She can't really like those who share her blood and are not of her race, okay? If all of this seems very fast to you, I will put it up on the web page, and you can go through it slowly yourself when you've got time. Um, and I'll give you a text as well. So we've got race in the narrow sense of race as family, and she's delighted to know that the Rivers family are her cousins, because you know that, that's her race. And in the broader sense, uh, St. John uh, considers the people of India to be his race, because he's going among them as a missionary. But Jane doesn't have that same feeling that St. John has. Uh, her heart is comparatively narrow. For her, Family is family. Blood is blood. Bertha is completely alien. So let's bring the story round now to St. John that I hope we've read about in the book now a bit. Uh, he's a curious character. Um, if we want to understand what J uh, Bronte is saying about empire and gender, we need to understand him uh, a little bit more. He's a good man, and Jane sees him as a good man, but he's cold. In the end, she doesn't marry him, and the reason is because he's cold. And he represses his passion. He, he forces his passion uh, away. Uh, he's, he's cold. We can see this in sexual matters especially. Even though he doesn't love Jane, he proposes to her because he thinks she'll be useful. And he rejects uh, the beautiful Rosamond Oliver, who is beautiful and rich. Um, and <laughs> when he sees her, he is flushed and kindled. She, 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 she does inspire passion in him, but no, 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 no sex, please. I'm British. I can't do that sort of thing. You know, he, he, he kind of uh, pushes his passions away because he believes that he has to serve God. He gives his life as a missionary in India, doing what he thinks of as God's work. And Jane, Jane agrees. She thinks it's God's work. And then he wears himself out at the end of the novel. He dies, or he's, he's about to die at the end of the novel there. So, 
Let's try and put those elements together. So just to get started, we haven't looked at the madness yet, but looking at the gender and empire aspects, uh, let's try and make some sense out of that. If we uh, think about it, the Victorians were moralists. Their stories always have a moral. There's always some teaching in what they write. So let's look at the moral lessons that we're getting from this. Firstly, uh, we see Rochester paying a high price for his £30,000. And uh, of course, Bertha, in a way, pays an even higher price. She, she gets locked up in the attic. But, but he pays a high price. He, he, he lives a miserable life for, for those £30,000 that he gets by marrying Bertha. So we can see that as some kind of punishment for something. By going to the colonies and taking a woman for his own gain, Rochester is not that different from the Turkish Sultan or the Roman Emperors. Remember, uh, we talked about last time, you're like the Roman Emperors, okay? Um, when, when the young John, uh, John Reed bullies Jane at the beginning of the story, she says he's like the Roman Empires. The Roman emperors, and of course, John also pays. He also dies. John, John Reed also dies in the novel as a sort of punishment for his bullying. And the fact that he's blinded in the fire, that Rochester is blinded in the fire, may be connected with the biblical story of the blindness of Saint Paul on his on his road to Damascus. It's the price of being saved. You have to pay a price to be saved. Um, you have to suffer. So it's a kind of punishment, and at the same time a kind of purifying of Rochester, symbolically. And in the Bible also, you've got the story of Samson and Delilah, where the price Sam Samson pays for his uh, lust for women uh, is blindness. And in the Greek tragedy of Oedipus, you've got the same thing. He puts out his own eyes after learning that the woman he's married is his own mother. So... Paul, Samson, and Oedipus, they all see God more clearly after they lose the sight of earthly things. And the symbolism of Rochester's blindness suggests that he too is being punished for some inappropriate sexual relations that he should never have married Bertha. Perhaps uh, at the bottom of all of this is a kind of racism in Bronte. Uh, he should never have married that foreign woman. All right, That's one way of looking at it. It's one way of understanding the story. Um, and maybe now his spirit is closer to God after he's paid the price, after he's paid his punishment. If we look at John Eyre, well, he doesn't get married at all. Uh, the story, it, it make, means he has to be, uh, John Eyre, uh, he has to be unmarried and childless in order for Jane to get his fortune. All right? The, the, if the uncle had a wife and a child, then the money would never have come to Jane. He works, he prophesies, he profits, he gets what he gains to Jane. And Jane, in the end, prospers. So his life in Madeira, uh, which is basically a cut, it's, it's not, it's more or less a colonial outpost, is tainted uh, only by loneliness. The loneliness that comes, he, remember, he quarreled with his brother, and he had no wife or family of his own, so that's why he doesn't give the money to uh, St. John and, and the two sisters, because he quarreled with their father. There's no penalty for his economic imperialism. Jane is allowed to benefit for it. There's no price that has to be paid there. I mean, he, he lives a lonely life, but, but he gets his money, and Jane can benefit from his money. There's no price to be paid, really. But uh, when it comes to uh, St. John, he doesn't want to exploit the colonies. He doesn't want to gain from colonialism. He's not like Rochester. He's not like John Eyre. He wants to give back. Apparently, uh, ostensibly, that's his aim. Not to take, but to give. Uh, but what, of course, what he wants to give is, the, is his own culture. He thinks that his culture is better, and therefore he can give it. That's what he imagines he, he, he sort of right. Uh, that may not be wanted or appreciated by the Indian people, uh, but uh, for Jane, and presumably for Bronte, uh, that's the right thing to do. It's kind of a tarimai for the Victorian people that they are better. 
and therefore they have the right to go and push their culture onto other countries and other people. But the task he's taken is huge, and uh, he rejects pleasure, the pleasure of, of marrying a woman that he loves, uh, and he brings himself an early death. So what's the message there? Well, the message is that uh, setting out to foreign lands to conquer a woman and win a fortune is a great mistake, and Rochester pays a big price. Uh, even to do so at home would be a mistake, uh, as the relationship with Blanche Ingram suggests. It's just, you don't do that. You don't go out to conquer a woman and win a fortune uh, in that sort of way. That's uh, effectively a kind of rape. At the opposite end of the spe spectrum, suppressing your own desires and setting out to foreign lands to give rather than to take, as St. John does, is a, a wonderful sacrifice, but in the end, uh, he destroys himself. And perhaps it's of no use because nobody really wants, or they, the Indian people may not want what he's got to give anyway. Uh, John Eyre is kind of in the middle position, and he gains materially, but he loses love and companionship. So in terms of gender politics, it plays out something like this. If you think that the colonial power is male, all right, England, Britain is male, and the colonized country is female, Rochester is a symbol of raping and pillaging Jamaica. John Eyre uh, is a symbol of marrying Madeira, making it his wife. He, he's engaged in a legal contract. It's a kind of substitute for a wife. Remember, he doesn't have a real wife. And St. John uh, is almost like a, a masochist serving a dominatrix. He goes off to serve, oh, denying himself his pleasure. All right, so so uh, that's the way that gender politics works out. If you think about it in that way, uh, that's the kind of gender politics of this situation. All right. So um, I haven't talked about the madness yet, but it's already we've spent about um, twenty minutes on this or so, and I think we should have a little break. So uh, okay. So the, se the second part of all of this, then, look looking to the topic of madness as such, the social context of madness in this period is that before this period, madness was essentially seen as something that happened to men. Most of the examples of madness, you, the, the pictures, the, the writings, the, the records, a lot of it would relate to men. But in the 19th century, you get what... Uh, Elaine Showalter called the, the feminization of madness, that madness be suddenly became a, a, women, a woman's thing. It was women who were likely to be mentally ill. You used to have disturbing images of wild, dark, naked men, but they then got replaced by poetic, artistic, and theatrical images of a youthful, beautiful female insanity. Uh, Ophelia for example, in Hamlet. I mean, I know that's a much earlier period, but the romantic way of thinking about Ophelia, uh, she would be a kind of symbol of that kind of idea of insanity in Hamlet's play. Uh, so Showalter connects this with a post-enlightenment paradigm, um, something that the happens in the 18th century, and women are typically on the side of irrationality, silence, nature and the body, while men are typically on the side of reason, discourse, culture, and mind. So the, the 18th century was a kind of turning point in the way that society saw women and men. Women are the emotional ones, the illogical ones. Um, they are related to, to nature and the body, but uh, men are related to logic and, and kind of scientific process and thinking like that. So there you've got, you've got it. On the male side, you've got reason, discourse, culture, and mind, activity, and independence. And men were supposed to have a healthy sexual appetite. Um, whereas women were irrational. Uh, they were silent. Uh, they were related to nature and the body. And they were passive. They were dependent. And they were supposed to be chaste and demure. They were not supposed to have an active sexuality. which. Bertha, Bertha comes from a different society, and she says, well, I'm a woman, what do you want? You know, she, 
she's like that. But maybe that's part of why Rochester thinks she's mad, you see, because she doesn't ha she's not chaste and demure. She, she has an, open, an openly demonstrative sexuality. So if women didn't live up to these male expectations of how they should behave, they were going to be called, or they were likely to be called, insane. Remember Jane on her, um, in her bed after being in the red room. All it took was two doctors to say, that's it, she's mad. And it could have happened. She had a lucky escape. Fortunately, it was not one of these men who came to see her. It was Mr. Lloyd who understood uh, much more sympathetically what was happening to Jane. So she had a, a, a lucky escape because the doctors were all men and she could easily have been declared insane at this time. The um, experience in the Red Room, if you look at the timeline of the novel, would be 1818. And Bertha Mason was declared insane. She was said to be mad a couple of years after that. So what kinds of treatment would, would a person like Bertha have had? This is what they did with crazy people in those days. Let's take a look at some of these images. All right, they, they basically to do with locking them up, putting them in small places, tying them up, uh, chaining their bodies. Uh, this was all considered to be good. You can imagine, if you weren't mad to start with, you would be mad by the time they'd done all these things to you, wouldn't you? Okay? This would drive you crazy. These were the things that they used to treat crazy people. They thought that that was going to make it better. I don't know why they thought that. I mean, it seems crazy for, in itself. But, but that's what they thought, that uh, insanity should be treated in, in that kind of way, by restraining people. Because, in their way of thinking, I suppose, Restraining yourself, controlling yourself, was what you should be doing. And if you can't do it yourself, then something should tie you down and force you to do it. So that was the standard treatment for the insane, for crazy people. Now that did change by the middle of the 19th century, but in uh, the time of Jane Eyre and Bertha's situation, that's what she could normally expect. So again, in a way, Bertha is kind of lucky because she escapes. She's not, she's not tied up and restrained in those kinds of ways. She is locked up in the attic at Thornfield. And she's got that servant, Grace Poole, watching over her. Uh, she escapes on several occasions, sets fire to the house, and kills herself at the end of the story. Well, if we remember how Jane was affected by being locked in the Red Room for just a few hours, then wow! You know, just imagine whether, what, what it's like for Bertha being locked up uh, for, 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 for years and years. So the question comes up, is she, is she mad because she's locked up in the attic or is she locked up in the attic because she's mad? You, how, would you, how would you really know? Okay, and some, some of you have already decided that more or less that's the topic for your paper or something close to that. So looking at Bertha herself, Bronte wants her to once, basically, she writes the story so that we should believe that her madness comes from inside her, not from her environment. And she uh, gives the detail that her mother and grandmother both went mad. So she's trying to push the idea that she goes mad because of uh, her family, because of her genetic Edain makeup. And Rochester, at the end of the novel, pays for his mistake in marrying such a woman and in marrying a, a Creole woman. Um, maybe that's the tale that Bronte wants to tell. That maybe that's how she wants it to seem. But for a lot of readers, Rochester is paying not for the mistake of marrying a foreigner, but for failing to understand a woman's mind, for trying to bring her passionate nature under his control. And so from that point of view, it's not Jane who's striking the blow for women's rights. The feminist in the story that, that is, is, is Bertha. Okay, and she's the one who has to be sacrificed. That uh, Rochester's real um, mistake was not understanding the nature of a woman. Okay, not understanding the passionate nature of women. 
So that would be a feminist analysis of the story. So there she is. Okay. Yeah, I'll give you some pretty pictures again. All right. <laughs> uh, when she burns the house and she wounds and blinds him in the process, she's taking the only revenge that's possible to her against the person who has destroyed her life. And that's another way of looking at the story, isn't it? Okay? And again, you have to debate. Is that okay to look at the story that way? Can you agree with looking at the story in that way? You have to choose. And nobody can tell you the right answer or the wrong answer. Only you can decide what you think is the right way to read and understand this story. That's why literature is such a great thing. It's your relationship with the text that matters in the end. So here we've got all of those three discourses, gender, empire, and madness. She is three times the victim of uh, male superiority, male hegemony. She is colonized, she is traumatized, and she is female. All right? Uh, gender, madness, and... Um, and empire, all three of these things come together in Bertha. But what about Jane? We all think that Jane is so reasonable and, and, and sensible and normal, but is she really? She learns through her school friend Helen and her teacher, Miss Temple. She grows up and learns how to control her passion. She learns how to keep her feelings in check and uh, behave herself according to the Georgic of her society. But what about that moment when she learns the truth, when she learns that the man she's about to marry already has a wife, when she learns about the mad woman in the attic? Her sanity is called into question again, just like it was when she was in the Red Room. There's a question of how crazy is Jane? when she has to decide whether to stay with Rochester, um, which is what he wants her to do, and be her mistress, or whether to leave Thornfield, she says, no, I'm leaving. I'm going to leave the man I love. I'm going to go off on my own. She's so upset that she even leaves behind, you know, she doesn't take any, she doesn't worry about money or anything. I will keep the law given by God. I will hold to the principles received by me when I was sane and not mad as I am now. At this moment when she finds out that Rochester has a wife, she considers herself mad. Okay? Laws and principles are not for the times when there's no temptation. They are for moments like this. They have a work. So I've always believed, and if I cannot believe it now, it's because I am insane. I am quite insane with my veins running fire, my heart beating faster than I can count its throbs. Preconceived opinions, foregone determinations are all I have at this hour to stand by. So she could give way to her madness, or she could say, if I wasn't mad, what would I do? <laughs> all right? But she considers herself at this moment to be mad. So she's not stable enough to judge, trust her own judgment, so she's going to make the decision uh, based on uh, the joshiki of her society, the laws and rules of correct behavior. And that goes for Christianity, the Bible, um, all of those things. She's putting her trust in God. And from a common sense point of view, uh, yeah, she does act in a way that's pretty crazy here. She goes off on her own, she ends up with no money in a place where she knows no one. Good thinking, Jane. And yet, she is not punished by Bronte, the moralist. She's rewarded for that.
behavior uh, seems irrational, and yet she, she is not, you know, that, that, that's the right, she's done the right thing. And that's because she's denied her passion, she's put her trust in God. And all through this part of the story, we get the word wild, the word, we get the word wild, 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 comes in so many, so many times. Before Jay leaves him, Rochester calls her a resolute, wild, free thing. But she's ne she never really becomes completely free. She's always looking for that new servitude. When she leaves his house, she says, I was weeping wildly as I walked along my solitary way. Fast, fast I went like one delirious, like one crazy. And all the time she believes God must have led me through this wilderness, again wild, until on a wild night, worn out and in the last degree ghastly wild and weather beaten, she comes to the door of her cousin's house. So this is all this sense of wildness. It's one of Bronte's favourite words. It comes in about 80 times into Jane Eyre. Mostly to the landscape, to Rochester, to Jane and, and to Bertha. But whereas Jane is wild and free, Bertha is wild and chained. She's a wild animal. She's a wild beast that's chained up. Jane holds on to her humanity. She holds on to her conscience and her self-respect. But Bertha loses all her human qualities. She becomes an animal or a goblin in her man madness. The challenge for Jane is to be wild and free, not wild and chained. But the paradox is that the only way to be free is to accept the rules of society. And again, some people have chosen that, or something close to that, as their theme for the uh, term paper. Jane, says Rochester, be still, don't struggle so like a wild, frantic bird that is rending its own plumage in its desperation. I am no bird, and no net ensnares me. I'm a free human being with an independent will. Okay, she states this, but in the end, she goes back to him. So where does that leave us? Again, so much to debate, so much to think about, so much to talk about. Okay? I'm going to finish up with a, um, freeing the insane, uh, where they, they started to close the lunatic asylums and let these crazy women, or let these women go back out into society at the, towards the end of the century. Okay, well, that's it, really basically.